uh, and we are on. Uh, this is GUI and in web browsers weekly call where we discuss GUI and browser things. It's uh, the last of July uh, 2019. And uh, let's jump to the agenda. The first topic on our agenda, I can maybe share my screen. The first topic is uh, discussing the default URL that we should, would like to see in location bar when people open IPFS website. Uh, so there's a PR and there's a very long discussion in that PR. But basically, we've been thinking should IPFS and domain name be a canonical representation or should that be IPNS? And initially this PR started as a proposal to support DNS link on both. And an open question was should which way we should redirect? Because we don't want to like people get confused by having uh, the same website on both namespaces, the, at least at the browser level, it should uh, converge at one uh, address. And there's a long discussion, but uh, I got a short summary here uh, from a call we had before to onboard you on some latest decisions and uh, concerns. So like the, the, the upside of allowing IPFS console slash DNS link in address bar uh, is the UX. It looks good and that's more or less, uh, it's self describing that uh, the website is powered by IPFS, but uh, on the con side, uh, it's breaking the map mental model people have around IPFS addressing where all IPFS paths and IPFS addresses were always immutable, which meant you can uh, fetch something today. And if you fetch something from the same address 20 years in the future, it you should give you the same uh, bytes. And if we allow DNS link on like IPFS namespace, uh, that introduces some confusion because People think it's immutable and it's no longer. At the same time, IPNS, uh, it's a problem, problem, has problems on, it, on its own. You can have IP, P2P uh, keys there uh, and have uh, that as a mutable pointer to something. You can also have DNS link, which acts as a mutable pointer to any content path, uh, but still, uh, there is uh, an understanding in the community that IPNS namespace is about mutable naming for IPFS. So um, sort of at this point, we agreed to support DNS link on IPFS protocol handler with a small caveat that it will, for now, it will redirect to IPNS protocol handler. So in the location bar, what will persist, it will be IPNS and then DNS link. Uh, that solves us uh, some harder discussions and uh, designing uh, in the short term, but in the long, we can always uh, change the way this redirect behaves. And what it unlocks is allows people to just type IPFS colon slash slash uh, and domain name in location bar. And uh, as soon as IPFS companion supports this change, it will just work so people can start using this uh, uh, URL and also this one. Um, I believe that's it for this uh, topic. If there are any questions, oh, there's uh, like a chat. I'll uh, stop sharing now. Um, yeah, so FQDN is a fully qualified domain name, I be believe. Um, uh, so that's uh, that's host name or domain name, depending on the context there are formalities around that. Did you?
Yeah, I had, I had a couple of questions about the, so that it seems like the main blocker for doing this would be the understanding in the community around immutability of anything that is in any way assumed to be an IPFS resource. But if you have the resolution of that name to CID, then that isn't necessarily trustable as immutable because that could potentially change to point to something else. Uh, is, so my, my question was really around who, who is doing this now? Who are the parties that are actually shipping IPFS clone slash slash? So he, who is the community of people that have an understanding? Um, uh, Yep, so uh, for now, the only uh, third party, um, like a spec or people who are using IPFS colon slash slash for something, or at least for like text representation, are uh, ENS guys for, they use it in the content hash spec. Um, I think I, fi I can find it shortly, yeah. So I'll put it in notes. Uh, I'll put it in chat and it should cool. be in Yeah, the, the way to, because it's hard to, it's hard to reason about what the impact of changing that understanding in the community is if we're just talking about the community as a, you know, ambiguous blob of activity or people somewhere. So it really helps that conversation if we talk about the people that are impacted by that potential change uh, very specifically, which yeah. who are the projects, who's shipping code, who are the communities or ecosystems that have dependencies on this understanding of the immutability of IPFS colon slash slash specifically. Yep, so, uh, and that's a very good example of non-browser context where IPFS colon slash slash is used already. Um, so if I, I believe if you have like a Ethereum blockchain uh, explorer, at least for ENS blocks and or contracts, uh, if someone has a ENS name pointing at IPFS address, uh, the text representation of that uh, would be IPFS colon slash slash and CID. Um, and they also support IPNS. Uh, there's a dedicated multi codec for that and the address looks like IPNS colon slash slash and there's a, a libp 2 p key. Um, so that's more or less uh, the current situation with this. Um, we will land support for IPFS colon slash slash DNS link in IPFS companion, just like a UX feature so people can paste links. Uh, even though it's not a canonical one, it won't be present, persisted in location bar, it makes it easier for people and at the same time it does not pollute uh, IPFS namespace with uh, mutable uh, mutable identifiers because it will explicitly redirect user to IPNS namespace uh, retaining the current status quo around uh, mutable and immutable namespacing. Well to, to some extent because by shipping that you're also training people, you're training users to expect that IPFS colon slash slash name to be something that is usable and familiar and understandable. So uh, I, I feel like you are, we are now, if we ship that feature, even though it is a redirect, uh, what people are able to share between each other is IPFS colon slash slash URLs. And that builds a community and an ecosystem around an understanding of that functioning in, in that way. In a, not immutable in a way. Uh, in theory, in practice, uh, if you redirect people to IPNS and that stays in location bar, and if someone wants to share that with someone, they will copy that address. So it's it's more like a sneaky feature for now. <laughs> uh, this, this is one area where it would be really neat to see if we can find some some published research from one of the browser vendors around. Uh, people's understanding of what schemes are and how they interact with them, and also maybe around uh, redirects. Um, I know the scheme, like so, up upgrading or, or switching protocols, so redirecting from scheme to scheme, is um, 
pretty challenging from a browser network and security standpoint uh, because the, the, the assumptions around the capabilities really change as the scheme changes. So that, that, that might be kind of awkward. So I think these that we're making impact our broader adoption strategy moving forward as we start shipping in more browsers, I think is, is important. And I don't think we fully understand that yet. But I, I'll see if I'll see if there's some research around how how we end users think about these things, uh, because again, like at, at a given that we're our project is 0 0.4, and we're at the you know nascent beginning of a potential adoption growth trajectory, if there's any time to kind of change these types of things and how like this is specifically about how we introduce ourselves as a protocol in front of end users. This isn't uh, the, the UX of the developer at this point is not even really part of that conversation as nearly as much as what that end user impact is gonna be. Yeah, so it's like mostly uh, how we present the IPFS websites loaded using DNS link. Because uh, like today, it, there's no concern around IPFS con slash slash CID. The concern is about uh, how do we present websites with human readable names that are DNS backed. Um, and also uh, something uh, that came up from this discussion, uh, it's like a sec something to, we will probably feel an issue later today is if we want to have a universal name, like universal protocol handler for all those multiple namespaces, we could have something like the web, uh, then you have uh, your name or your identifier, and then at the very end, you stick the protocol, like the actual protocol namespace, and that gives you a uh, origin pair protocol. But that's just like a cute hack for, to think about uh, in case we don't end up with uh, IPNS or IPFS permanently in location bar. I, I guess one, one thing to think about is that, I mean, one lesson we learned in browser land is that most users don't really understand any of it at all, no matter how hard you try in the URL bar. And that's why Google keeps trying to basically hide the URL that's because good. hiding the URL reduces confusion and it actually opens up new doors to how to visually communicate these things. Yeah, so. and that's something we, we discussed uh, in the pre previous uh, call that uh, Chrome hides the protocol. So we actually, we care about, should that be IPFS or IPNS or something else? And that effectively like Chrome hides it. Only Firefox will, for now, we will show it permanently in user's view. Um, yep. So it's, from a pragmatic point of view, it's mostly making sure in case someone writes URL that, or clicks a URL or like types the URL that looks like that in location bar, will it return error or will it return, redirect user to a valid place they wanted to load in the first place. Um, I believe that's more or less on this topic. Uh, anyone wants to add something? All right, let's move to UI indicators <laughs> for connected, connecting and off state. Uh, should I do that or Eric, do you want to? I'm just catching up. Um, I I haven't fully grokked all of your. You're talking about the icons. Yep. For the tray, um, I'd be curious to hear. Yeah, I, I can you were the most latest, the, the most recent commenter. I would be interested to hear you yep. verbalize. Yeah. So, like, uh, long story short, is that right now we are using uh, IPFS icon everywhere. Uh, just that blue cube. So the blue cube indicates your node is connected to the network, it's online. It has at least one peer 
or it has zero peers, but it's trying very hard to connect to the network. Uh, and the gray one uh, tells you that your node is uh, offline. So we have a gray one and blue one, but it does not look too well on like Mac. Uh, and also as well on, on Windows, uh, a lot of operating systems and as well, same with uh, browsers. Uh, a lot of uh, user interfaces moved uh, to uh, monochromatic uh, black and white uh, icons. Uh, so the an effort is to come up with some way to indicate online, offline, and connecting states that feels native and we could reuse in Mac, Windows, and also maybe in browser extension, because it would be good if both IPFS desktop and IPFS companion use the same visual language to indicate those things. Um, and we, in the linked issue, we, we are like discussing some prototypes around indicating uh, connectivity by uh, showing those like uh, connection points uh, protruding from the cube and uh, there are some, some mockups how it would look like in a black and white scheme and uh, how it looks on Mac, how it looks on Windows, some scaling issues. And I also uh, played a little bit with IPFS Companion uh, to see how those new icons would look in the browser context. Uh, and I, I realized that the proposed uh, Protruding uh, circles make a nice animation if you <laughs> if you make it animate. Um, so that's more or less on uh, on this. If you if Eric wants to add anything, uh, my, my only addition would be that holy smokes, there's a lot of different places where these icons uh, are going to appear, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so erring on the side of um, you know simplicity and. <laughs> Attempting to follow uh, the guidelines established by folks like Apple is probably a good thing, you know, like that, uh, for example, not, um, you know, using only the, the template, the, you know, pure black and white um, for, for the basic tray icon is, is preferable to using, you know, to using color most most of those icons don't really use color, except sometimes um, to indicate like an active state they do. Like, like right now, they, uh, on my desktop, I see that uh, Creative Cloud has an update for me and they have a notification, which happens approximately every five minutes from them. So I'm ignoring it, but it's a red dot. Um, but additionally, the, the old one, you know, uses color or tone. <laughs> as as like the primary indicator and that's not you know that's not necessarily the the most um the the best indicator i mean some people can't really tell the difference between shades and uh yeah and additionally you know just the high the higher contrast is going to be um is is going to be something that's not based in color i mean usually color is used as as a it's best used as a supporting communicator as opposed to the sole way of communicating a state, for example. So the, so something with the dots, for example, literally changing uh, like the dots starting in a, in a hover, uh, hovering around the or orbiting around the box. It helps to make the, the box itself uh, a little, the, the whole graphic itself a little bit, uh, bigger without actually <laughs> enlarging the box because that um, that gets to be a little bit too dominant and clunky and it, it the box needs a little space to breathe <laughs> so that's why I put the dots like around the edge um, and they're also you know disconnected to begin with they're they're just waiting for you to to start talking to them um, and then snapping them to the box um, to indicate that they're connected, I thought was a cute was a cute little communication method, um, and then I I added a just a simple 
uh, box, hairline box around that whole thing when that happens too, so that you're not, so that we don't have all of a sudden the whole entire thing shrinking down. That's not in the animation, but it's further up in the page. Uh, yeah. it's X percent better than. Uh, I like. I'm excited with uh, coming up with uh, something that looks good and I, can be animated. Because, especially like in, in the case of like IAPFS Companion, uh, and if you run embedded node, it takes a few seconds for the spin spin up to connect to the swarm. And it's awkward to, to show the offline icon when you are connecting. So uh, some sort of like- Yeah, those dots uh, present good animation options. You know, in addition yep. to the snapping, they could orbit around, you know, and they could, they could do all sorts of fun things yeah. with sound effects, with whistling. I'm not sure about that. We can discuss that separately. The first Chrome extension with <laughs> with audio yeah how cool. to get how to get removed from uh, extension store <laughs> that's a badge of honor i'd rather not that. by the way thanks for doing that work little good stuff cool so if anyone has opinions or ideas on how to indicate connected, connecting an offline state? Or are there any other opportunities of states that we missed? Uh, please comment on that issue. Uh, I believe now we can move to the next one unless someone wants to follow up on UI and indicators. Yes, no, yes, no, no, okay. Uh, Dietrich, I believe uh, text matrix is next. <laughs> Sorry, I was just going to say this, like, as a general concept, this idea of the state, like, this is something we talk about in offline camp of, like, the UI of these states being different than you're used to, like, it's safe here, it's somewhere, but not on my machine, all of that stuff that happens in traditional web applications with some weird statuses that people aren't used to symbols for is definitely, definitely, the problem extends beyond the project, so it's cool to see it being treated, and we might get in, I don't know how soon we're making a decision on this, but it was something we could bring up at offline camp as well if you wanted more feedback from a broader audience. Cool. The visual language, this could be, you know, the first word for a visual language that we're developing. Yep. All right. I so I, sh I shared a, a document here and started as part of the Q3 work to make sure that we are uh, not being regressed in desktop GUI companion and probably other places too around faster and cadence changes in core JS and IPFS implementations. Started looking at kind of the overview, the high level view of what's tested and what's not tested and whether something is tested automatically when core things in core change. Uh, trying to get a, a kind of the, what the big picture is around where our testing and regression vector gaps are. Uh, is there, for example, a question like, is there a place where if something breaks, we would have no way to know it, know it until we either ship it and somebody tells us, uh, or we're doing manual testing and we have to try and, and hope that we find it. Uh, if you have any ideas around uh, if there are issues or repos that track this kind of work now, it'd be great to add it to this table. If there are other scenarios that you know of that in, in these three given parts of the project um, that should be tested or other types of, I just drafted this list uh, off the top of my head. I don't really know how much of this already exists, if none of this exists, uh, but it seems like things that we probably want to exist at some point to make sure that we're not breaking ourselves uh, without knowing it. Uh, it's fine, fine to break ourselves. That's a normal part of iterative development. We just wanna know when we break ourselves so we can unbreak or, or back out uh, changes that are breaking. So if you have any thoughts about this, 
kind of work. And this probably actually should be in the, maybe the testing and infra group as well. So maybe I'll stop by their meeting next week and share this. Yeah, I believe uh, we we should like populate this table with the current uh, state, and I, I already see some things that are not here, so I'll add them after the call. Great, thanks. All right. Uh, We're on to the next one, which is yep. mine. I'm going to keep this short. Um, so there's an issue on the peers tab in the web UI. Uh, once you get past like 100 peers, it starts to get kind of slow. And it's actually already noticeable with a lower number of peers. If you scroll through the table, um, you'll notice that the table appears and, and disappears while you're scrolling. And the reason it's doing that is because um, it's actually re-rendering that entire table um, every time one of the peers gets their location resolved. So whether that's being resolved from the cache or finally being resolved from a lookup, uh, it's re-rendering that table, which is problematic because it, it's costly to re-render that entire table. Um, so after looking at it, I think we've got a few choices there. Um, one of the things that I initially thought was maybe we have a component inside of the table that handles the resolution rather than, so that rather than rendering the whole table, we just re-render um, unknown to whatever the location it is that we find. Um, and that way we don't have to worry about re-rendering a whole table. It's just a small little bit of the, the data inside of the table. Um, the problem with that is that then you can't really sort by that because it's not going to be in the data set that's used when rendering the table. Um, so that that's a, a trade-off there. Um, the other option is to use something like RxJS or a reducer, or some kind of transducer, to take the massive amount of data and then uh, debounce it, I guess, so that it, it doesn't re-render every time up here gets resolved instead it's only re-rendering you know every minute or something or not every minute every second or something like that so that it's uh not every 10 milliseconds or however often it's happening right now um i just wanted to see if you guys have any opinions on that what's kind of the trend for handling this inside of web ui as far as i can tell there isn't anything doing that right now um do we know what's the current uh, like refresh rate for the peer screen? <laughs> uh, I couldn't tell you the exact number. I, I had it set up to um, log every time it was rendering and it was enough that it was scrolling faster than I could keep up with. And uh, I, I, I can get stats for that if that would be helpful, but it's it's really often at the very beginning. And then after that, it's it's much slower as it's you know resolving fewer and fewer peers since it's already tried to go through the majority on the list. Um, so yeah, I, I can't tell you. Yeah, but uh, after after it comes down, uh, mm -hmm. it's like one, once, a sec once a second or? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of just whenever a new peer connects, it tries to resolve that. And, and if it does resolve it, then it does a re-render. So really the issue yeah. is the first time you go to the page and it's going through that whole list. So once you stay on that page for a while, then it's not an issue. But if you've got, you know, I, I think the issue came up when one had like 26,000 peers connected, which is insane. Um, and obviously that's not gonna go, that's not gonna end after a minute. You're gonna be resolving peers for as long as you're on that page. So uh, definitely noticeable there. Uh, we, we sort of, what in in other contexts when we have to do a lot of uh, asynchronous uh, uh, like results, uh, we often throttle that using like a queue, which limits uh, the number of concurrent mm -hmm. uh, tasks. Uh, 
that would probably help here. Yeah, they actually have that in place now for the resolution of the the locations. They have a queue set up with concurrency and all of that. So it's it's getting throttled already, but it, it's still happening too often for the rendering phase. So it's almost like there needs to be another throttle outside of the resolution that's happening to prevent over rendering as well. Because it's resolving yeah. fat really fast, but we don't want to re render all of that as soon as it comes through, just because it could be problematic for large data sets. Yeah, that's true. Eric? I'd, I, yeah, I'd go with, uh, with, with the bouncing it, because like, it's probably a safer bet to decrease the rate we refresh like it does not need to be that fast it does not need to be that exact yeah. honestly i don't think people would be worried if it uh, like refreshed once a second yeah <laughs> it's just you won't have uh, even if you care about like a latency column mm -hmm. if you like refresh faster than like half a second it's, it loses its meaning yes yeah. it will j jump too fast yeah. so actually we need to slow it down to that level that most of people can, can just process. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sounds good. I'll, I'll look at getting a debouncer in there then. What, what were you going to say, Eric? Yeah, I was just wondering if we could go ahead and do that smaller, just refreshing the element inside of the actual whole table. And when they choose to sort at that time, maybe refresh and then sort. Mm -hmm. That's possible. Yeah, I probably could do something like that. Um, I'll have to look at that a little bit more closely to see what it would take to only include that in the data set if they've selected to sort by it. There's probably a way we could do that. I mean, if you need help coding okay. that, I won't, I won't be able to, to help you. <laughs> I'll bring you snacks and, uh, and give you encouragement. <laughs> Sounds good. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you for looking at this. Uh, the next one is Docs Tax Task Force. Sorry. Yes, indeedy. Um, I will share my screen. So one of the uh, one of the tasks that we landed on. Um, one of the tactics that we thought might be interesting, useful uh, towards improving the, you know, the overall docs experience and making the docs uh, more effective uh, is to put a little quiz or uh, uh, a little sort of a, a little menu, uh, encapsulated menu of um, listing the kinds of things that I might want to do or with IPFS or get out of IPFS, basically why I am visiting IPFS.io. You know, um, the two possible uh, improvements that could come out of uh, creating a, a little utility like this are, you know, uh, we kind of get a better idea of what people uh, are visiting the site, what they want from the site, so that can, uh, inform personas or whatever, you know, we've got developers, we've got researchers, we have all sorts of people in theory who are coming to IPFS.io. Um, and then additionally, we could be channeling people, maybe those people more effectively into uh, the content that's in, the content that we have, whether that's the helpful content that's in docs maybe, or it's in proto school, or, you know, maybe it's in a thread somewhere, um, but, Currently, the, the layout of, of docs, you know, the organization of docs, you know, needs a little bit of information architecture work anyway. And also, it's not all on docs, right? And so, we have, um, actually, why don't I just go to the, uh, if you check out this, the uh, linked um, issue, maybe you already have, there's, um, it's it's interesting to see where all these links actually go when you are in uh, on IPFS.io. Just as a sidebar, you know that they, they click to places that are you know disparate, and some of them 
look similar. Some of them don't look similar. You click it, or you, and even the, the the structure of the of the site is, uh, uh, is modified a little bit when you click in, into it, such as the um, the blog section. When you click into the blog, all of a sudden the top nav gets an additional item added, which is media, and that's the only place I could find the media in the top nav. <laughs> it's secretly like. <laughs> So if you're very good, I have a very good eye for detail. You might be able to find our media on IPFS.io. Uh, and so this is a uh, proposed reflow. Uh, so currently, it it says try it. We have try it, and then uh, what is it? Learn more or something? I don't know. I've already forgotten. Watch demo. So watch demo links to a video from 2015, which has, which is vintage, you know, and people like vintage stuff. So that's valuable maybe, but it's also, uh, it, and it's, and it's Juan, you know, and it, it's well-informed and, and whatnot, but it's um, maybe not the best thing to, to be, to have right at the top of the page right now and try it, which scrolls you down the page to the implementations. There are multiple issues going on here, and, and hopefully what we're proposing as a really quick test to implement within a couple of days will actually also maybe alleviate or give us a, a window into how we might alleviate some of these extra issues like the fact that implementations and install are, you know, it's kind of a conflation going on there. Uh, because if you click into install, it brings you to the, you know, the CLI um, install IPFS and implementations down here goes to, you know, has Go JavaScript desktop, does not have the other, a link to the other way of, of installing. So there, there's a, a little bit of confusion in my mind. I, I reckon there is some people have some confusion. So here um, instead, what if we had a simple button <laughs> which was, I don't know if it was get started, just simple simple call to action, uh, which would lead people either further down on the page or to another page. And actually, why don't I jump into the Envision demo? Have you all actually already found the Envision prototype? If not, I will show it to you. But you can find the link right there on that issue. So two different design options, accordions is where we're leaning. So what we're uh, doing here is trying to get as few, uh, as simple of, a, of an experience as possible. And so not a lot of cognitive load for the visitor. And this is just wireframes, of course, this isn't design. And so four of the, um, the four, roughly these these four um, questions that are, are or needs are where we've landed. I need to learn, I want to learn about the distributed web. I wanna store and share files. I wanna do uh, manage large amounts of data. This might be, you know, each of these implies a certain user group. Um, so without coming right out and saying it, I am an individual, I am, I am an individual and I wanna sh sh store and share files, you know. We can, we can figure out, uh, make a good guess at what kind of people those are. Um, so yeah, we, we might do these uh, simple accordions that then drive uh, drive people to some of this sort of curated links, right? So maybe some of the content we have in docs right now uh, is useful if you're like really hardcore and drilling, 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 and you have a very specific problem. But perhaps the lion's share of the of the of the or the most useful content is a lot smaller of a list. You know, it's a lot more manageable a collection. And some people currently might have trouble finding, uh, discovering what those are. And so this is a way to, to lead them there more efficiently. Um, and of course, all of this uh, would be measured. We'd have metrics for all this so we can get a good idea of like, oh, pretty much everyone wants to implement IPFS, uh, wants to use IPFS. So, we need to prioritize the devs as our, you know, a primary use case, which is actually probably the truth. Um, and and the, 
the catch-all as well. So one of the, uh, in addition to this, uh, to these accordions, this is a quick take at um, merging the implementation, kind of merging the implementations on the install panel. And uh, at the same time, giving them uh, a suggested path to take, which is to install IPFS desktop. And Chris and I have been collaborating on all this and he's got um, much uh, better words to, to describe um, why IPFS desktop uh, should be a path that we would push people down, that we would lead people down. Uh, is this his chat here? Uh, I'm not sure what dist.ipfs.io is <laughs> offhand. So there's I, another site. Oh. Yeah, as I understand it. Anyway, ignoring talk about cognitive load. I was talking about that a minute ago. I'm the uh, chief sufferer of overload. Uh, IPFS desktop is. You know, it, at the same time, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it's installing, you know, it's taking care of this, of the command line stuff as well in it. And, and it's just a, a really, um, you know, we're putting so much attention into making this not just, you know, not a beginner's per se um, in, uh, application so much as uh, a handy and super easy to use and handy utility that helps everyone understand what the nuts and bolts are of IPFS, you know, and it, and it helps developers understand more about how it works and it's, it's visual. So then just have, have the rest of the, uh, of the various app, some of the apps down there. I just thought I'll have the links. I don't need to share anymore. I have a question about this distributions page. Is it, do people who know more than me feel really strongly that it should say distributions and not downloads? Like you go there and it says, this is the downloads website. Do people, everybody else know what the word distribution means and that you'd click it and go to downloads? It's it, yes, if you come from Linuxy land. Do you, does does everyone in the IPFS community except I, Terry come from Linuxy land? No. Nope. Like it's fine if they do. I'm, I'm just it's giving you the uh, like, I'm giving you the ed word etymological word. history of it. Yeah. No thinks they do. Either really strongly agrees with me or thinks I'm the only one who doesn't know about that. No, I, I think we agree it's a problem. I do. That's why I brought it up. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it also it only has a subset of the things we actually ship and uh, that has the same visual uniformity that can feel problems that Eric is trying to address here. It's, I brought it up as a great exhibit of all of the problems, disconnected visual uniformity yeah. lack and not even actually accurate and uh, language specific to a, to a specific domain. And honestly, if you want to build that website, you won't have good time. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Like, I don't think I would know, a, like, a, I guess implementation, I would kind of know is like a language of the thing. But I don't think I would really know what a distribution was, really. Yeah, it should probably eventually just redirect whatever the new download speed is. You got it in one D trick. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like the new installs page will eventually be all encompassing and have all the things exactly. And each section we can then expand and contract it based on what route they came in from as well. And it won't say distributions in the header. This is, and I think that could create some confusion with the uh, decentralized web, distributed web, maybe distributions. Decentralizations. So anyway, uh, hopefully we can get that implemented and get some 
get some good actionable insights out of that ASAP. Yes, sir. Is, is this a Q3 target targeted change? It's an ASAP, yes, Q3. Probably next couple of weeks, I would say, depending on various holidays and whatnot. <laughs> By that, he means next week, the latest. Said the guy who won't be implementing it. <laughs> so it's with a link. I think we have a few more minutes and a, a demo is here on the decks. Yeah, but do I have time to, to demo? Seven minutes. Let's do it. Do it. Are you seeing my screen? I think it's kind of cropped a little bit. We can see it. Uh, but I like this. Okay. Uh, so this is a, a CLI tool that I built, and it's probably useful to anyone developing anything in JavaScript or Node.js or whatever you want to call it the language we do things. Um, basically the problem it tries to solve is when you we use NPM as the, the way to handle all the dependencies and stuff, either NPM or Yarn. Um, basically when we want to connect one uh, package to another, let's say we have a package full of tests and we have JSIPFS and JSIPFS imports the, the tests to, to run. So sometimes when we are developing, we need to change the test in one place and then run it in another place, let's say the test and JSIPFS. When we have this situation, we need to link them locally in our machine uh, to be able to develop fast or else we would uh, need to change here uh, do a release and then pull the re release on this side and run the tests, which is very troublesome. So we link and Yarn and NPM have this functionality, which is link one package to another. Um, but basically, uh, link has a big, big problem. That's what I'm going to show you and how Connect Apps, this new uh, package that I built, uh, solves that problem. So if we, if we go here into the dependencies, this is JSIPFS. Can you see, or I need to make it bigger? It's fine. Okay. So if we go to node modules, it is a little folder that has everything that uh, the code imports. Uh, we have here a little tool that we use, which is Azure. Um, and Azure itself has a bunch of node modules too. So as you can see the list right now, this is a clean install, uh, it's quite small. It's only these ones. And this happens because when you install, uh, NPM does a bunch of stuff and basically deduplicates a bunch of dependencies and arranges them. So you don't have like a million of them and, if, uh, and only one version. Um, so the dependencies are quite small. Then if you wanna, if you wanna do, uh, if you link, directly as I'm doing here in the, the console. I'm using Yarn because I normally use Yarn. It's the same thing at NPM or Yarn. If you link Azure, what happens, it's basically this. The folder becomes like stupidly big because it's basically doing a symlink uh, from one folder to the other. So what the problem, the big problem here, what, uh, is that the dependency tree is not the same. If we do a clean install, you get the first version that you saw. If you link, you get this version. So it's not, it's basically not the same code base. And that uh, sometimes gets us into big troubles because we find some error and we don't know where it comes from and probably is from this specific problem. So let me just unlink. I will probably need to do a full install. 
uh, what Connect Apps does is basically um, ensures that the dependency tree is always the same as if you were to install from scratch. Uh, and what, how does it do this? It basically goes to the to the second like uh, package and does an npm pack, which is what an npm normally do when you publish to the uh, online registry, and then gets this uh, little zip file and installs directly on JSIPFS on this side, on this package. And that's basically what, what happens if you do a normal uh, npm install uh, uh, for a new dependency. So it does the same thing that you would do um, when you install a new dependency. And that gives us the correct uh, dependency tree. So I'm, kind of, I'm going to run uh, connect apps. I'm here right now in the terminal. So what I want to do is to link, and now I give it the related path to uh, uh, Asia. So it's, we go back one folder and then we have Asia here. And this gives us some little extra files here so just to keep track of things. And then we want to connect Azure or just connect, connect. And this is packing Azure and installing uh, Azure on JSFDFS uh, directly from the zip file or the tar file. And when this ends, this normally is faster when Zoom is not running. What happens is if you remember the previous state, the first state, we get the small version of the node modules. And this is uh, basically the way Connect Depths works and the problem it solves, uh, which is quite annoying when we are trying to link and develop at the same time. Uh, and at the end, you can just reset. And right now, you can see that the, um, you have package.json, which is basically a list of all the packages that, that you are using. Asia is not like where the version, not the, the, the version it should be. So we, when you reset, everything gets clean and gets reverted to the previous state, and you get a clean, um, a clean ripple with no changes at all. As you can see, my editor is telling me that there's no change at all in this repo, so uh, it reverted correctly. So basically, this is how Connect Apps works. Uh, just wanted to show you this because if you are a developer, this might be useful for you. That, that's it. It's awesome. Honestly, at least one, one guy will totally appreciate it because in IPFS Companion, when I work on JS IPFS, with those polyfills on top of Chrome sockets that we need to like to get it like nodes, net module, and stuff like that, and we also run uh, Happy JS in web browser, and Happy JS loads some promit some like server side modules. Uh, so long story short, if I use Yarn Link. It just, it's not like it may produce problems. It just does not build. I had to mm -hmm. go the pack route or just point at the remote branch to go to the, mm -hmm. even the build. So it's like highly useful for me. Thank you. Yeah, you can connect uh, multiple uh, packages at the same time. And you, al you also have a watch mode, which basically watches for changes and does everything automatically. So you don't need to worry about it, just go. It is, a, it is a little bit slower or much slower because Yarn Link doesn't take any time at all because it's just a link. Uh, but at least it's correct and doesn't give you problems. Yeah, yeah. It's like I totally v love that it values like the, the correctness and it actually gives you a static snapshot. So yeah. you won't, won't like pull the carpet from within under your, yourself by editing something in a separate. Thingy. So it's like, yeah. And right now it only supports Yarn, but Folker is already working on a PR to support NPM, so it will support both shortly. Cool. Thank you.
I believe we nearly fit within an, our time slot. So uh, unless there's something that requires our attention, I believe uh, that's a wrap for this week. If if you're in the summer, if you are planning on heading out, make sure your your teams know if you're just going to Ocean Islands woods in the middle of nowhere. Just a reminder. I think I've talked to three people in this room who are taking vacation soon. Yep. I believe that's a wrap. Bye, everybody. See ya. Um,